this video, we're going to talk about the fundamental theorem of calculus for line integrals. So we're going to start by looking back at the chain rule. We have a function of two variables, x and y. And each of those variables, both x and y, are dependent on our functions of t. Then we learned that dz dt equals the partial of f with respect to x times dx dt plus the partial of f with respect to y times dy dt. So notice that we use dz dt because ultimately z only depends on a single variable t. Indirectly through this function f and then the other two functions x and y. But if we look at this expression, it looks like a dot product. And in fact, we can write it as a dot product. And one of the terms in the dot product is going to be the gradient of f. So now, if I look at uh, the vector x of t comma y of t, as maybe the parameterization of a curve, then our second vector in this dot product is really just r prime. So I could look at this dot product as the gradient of f evaluated at r of t dotted with r prime of t. Now, that looks really familiar. In fact, it looks like the familiar Calc 1 chain rule. We have z, which is f composed with r of t, and its derivative with respect to t would be the derivative of the outside. But now, instead of having regular derivative or single variable derivative, we have the gradient, the gradient of the outside. And instead of saying times, we're going to have, use a dot product. So dotted with the derivative of the inside. So we have the gradient of the outside dotted with the derivative of the inside. Now that tells me something else as well. This expression is the derivative of f of r of t. So that means that f of r of t must be an antiderivative of the gradient of f dotted with r prime of t. So let's see how that connects to line integrals. So suppose that I have a curve with a parameterization given by r going from t equals a to t equals b. And I'd like to evaluate the line integral of f dot dr using that parameterization. So now I'm going to have the integral from a to b of f of r of t dotted with r prime of t. Hey, that's what we were just looking at. Now, if almost almost, right? Because what we were looking at, let me just go back to remind myself, is we'd have the gradient of a scalar field. Here we just have a vector field. But if that vector field is conservative, it can be written as the gradient of a scalar function. And so then I would have the gradient of f evaluated at r dotted with r prime of t. And we just learned that an antiderivative of that expression is f of r of t. So I can go ahead and apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. I would take the value of that antiderivative at b and subtract the value of the antiderivative at a. So our antiderivative is f of r of t. So I'll take f evaluated at r of b 
minus F evaluated at R of A. And that is our fundamental theorem for line integrals. If we have a smooth curve with this given parameterization, and F has to be a differentiable function of several variables. So all of our discussion involved two variables, but we could have three or even more variables. Provided that the gradient vector is continuous on uh, that, uh, along that curve C, then uh, the value of the line integral of the gradient of F dotted with dr along the curve C is simply F evaluated at R of B minus F evaluated at R of A. So let's look at some examples. I'd like to evaluate this line integral of the uh, gradient of f dotted with dr. f is a scalar function here, uh, two variables, x squared plus y squared. And uh, c is going to be the portion of the parabola uh, 4 minus x squared, where x starts at 0 and goes to 2. So it'll start on the y-axis at 0, 4, and move down to the x-axis at 2, 0. So our gradient field is just the vector field with components 2x and 2y. And for our parameterization, well, here we have y given as a function of t, so we'll let x equal t, and then y will get from the formula 4 minus t squared, and t goes between 0 and 2. So using the fundamental theorem, then this would just be our scalar function evaluated at r of 2 minus the scalar function evaluated at r of 0. So when r equals 2, we're on the x-axis, 2 comma 0. When r equals 0, we're on the y-axis at 0 comma 4. And substituting these values, x and y values, into the formula for the original function, I get, well, 2 squared is 4. 4 squared is 16. 4 minus 16 gives me negative 12. All right, in our second example, we've got the same scalar field. We've got a different curve, though. Now we just have a line segment joining the same initial and terminal points. So I'm going to use a different parameterization, same gradient field. I'm just going to use 1 minus t times the position vector of the initial point plus t times the position vector of the terminal point, which I can write cleanly as just the vector 2t comma 4 minus 4t. And remember, when I use this uh, affine representation, uh, I am just going to uh, have t vary from 0 to 1. It really doesn't matter what the x and y coordinates vary as. When I use this parameterization for a line segment, t always varies from 0 to 1. All right, so then using the fundamental theorem for line integrals, the value of the gradient of f dotted with dr, uh, the line integral along c, will just be the function evaluated at r of 1 minus the function evaluated at r of 0. And so I'm evaluating the same two points. So I'm getting the same 4 minus 16, which would be negative 12. In our third example, we have a very different curve. Same scalar function, f of x comma y equals x squared plus y squared. But now our curve is the portion of the ellipse y squared over 16 plus x squared over 4 equals 1, which is in the first quadrant. And we're going to traverse that ellipse clockwise. So we have the same gradient field. 
But what about the parameterization? Going clockwise is a bit awkward uh, for our usual parameterization because our usual parameterization is going to use our sines and cosines. And uh, we would like to then traverse this anti-clockwise, so t increases. t is an increasing angle. So that's no problem. What we'll do is we'll find a parameterization for the opposite of c. Remember, the opposite of c is the same curve, but traversed in the opposite direction. And doing that is simple. We can just use the standard. R of t is going to be 2 cosine t comma 4 sine t. The 2 comes from the fact that I have x squared over 2 squared. 4 for sine t comes from the fact that I have y squared over 4 squared. And then we're only going to be in the first quadrant. So t is going to start at 0 and go to pi over 2. Well, can I still use my fundamental theorem? Sure, I just have to remember that when I find the line integral over the opposite of c, I have to change the sign of the value of the line integral. And so now I would just uh, evaluate this line integral as being the function at r of pi over 2 minus the function evaluated at r of 0. After I take that difference, then I just have to remember to change the sign. Well, now I'm going to get the same two points evaluated in a different order, but then because I multiply it by negative 1, I still get the same answer, negative 12. So in our first three examples, we evaluated the same, uh, uh, let me put it this way, the, the line integral with the same gradient function, but for three different curves. But all three curves shared the same initial point and the same terminal point. And by the fundamental theorem, we know that the value of the integral only depends on the value of the uh, function at the initial point and at the terminal point. So, of course, we got the same answer. And so this leads us to the notion of independence of path. We saw that in those three examples, the value of the integral really didn't matter what path we took to go from the initial point to the terminal point, whether it was a parabola or a line segment or part of an ellipse, or it could have been even something more complicated. In the end, the value of the integral only depended on the function of that scalar uh, function, uh, the value of that scalar function at the initial point and the terminal point. But in general, that's not true. If I just have a general vector field and I take the line integral over two paths that have the same initial point and terminal point, in general, that, those line integrals are not going to be equal to each other. But suppose that f is a conservative vector field. Then I know that f can be written as the gradient of some scalar function. And so then I would be able to use the fundamental theorem for line integrals and conclude that the line integral over both paths would be the same. So now, if I have a continuous vector field on a domain D, we say that the line integral, so no, this is a property of the line integral. And actually, it's not really the property of the line integral. It's a property of any line integral on this domain D. We say that it is independent of path provided that if you have any two paths with the same initial point and the same terminal point, the line integral is going to be the same. And really, it, it's not a two fixed initial, you know, two points for it, which are initial. You take any two points in D to be your initial point and your terminal point, and this statement is still going to be true for any two paths. 
that connect those two points, um, you'll get the same value for the line integral. All right. For our next discussion, we're going to have to talk about closed curves. Well, what is a closed curve? It is a curve that has the same initial point and the same terminal point. So it starts at a point and it goes around and does something and then it comes back to the same point again. So suppose that I've got uh, a domain where the line integral of f dot dr is independent of path, and I have a closed curve in this domain D. So closed curve, again, it starts at A, goes around and does something, and comes back to A. It has the same initial point and terminal point. Well, what I could do is add a second point to that curve, which will break it up into two curves, and those two curves are going to go have the same initial point A and the same terminal point B. Now I can still write my an original curve, original closed curve, as the union of one of the curves with the second curve traversed in the opposite direction. All right, so I have to be careful about the direction here because I have to go back to A. Well, going back to A means that when I traverse this path, I'm going in the opposite direction of C2. All right, well, because this line integral is independent of path, I can say that if I take the line integral along C1 or the line integral along C2, I'm going to get the same answer. That's independent of path. So do some algebra so that now I know this difference is going to be zero, so that the difference between the value of the integrals is zero. And then what I'm going to do is with the second integral, which is along the path C2, I'm going to change that to be along the path opposite of C2. When I do that, that means I'm going to have to change the sign in front of it from a minus to a plus. But now look what I have. The sum of these two integrals is the same as the line integral along the original closed curve C. And so now we've determined that if this uh, line integral is independent of path and the path is a closed curve, then we know that the value has to be zero. Now, it's very important to dis distinguish or to know or to emphasize that you're taking a line integral on a closed curve. So we have a special symbol for that. So if you have a closed curve and a line integral along that closed curve, we put a little circle on the integral sign to indicate that it is a closed curve. It's really an emphasis. There's nothing wrong with this notation over here where we don't have a circle on the uh, integral sign. We put the circle there though to emphasize that it's a closed curve. And so now we have a characterization for independent path. We can say that the line integral is independent of path if and only if its value is zero for every closed path in D. So how does that connect back to conservative vector fields? Well, certainly we know that if we have a conservative vector field, then the line integral is independent of path. Um, and we know that if uh, we have this theorem here, that if uh, you take the line integral of something that's independent of path, then uh, along a closed uh, integral, so let me emphasize that 
in the closed path. I'll go ahead and use my circle there to emphasize that we took the line integral with respect to a closed curve. It's going to be zero for every closed path in D. So remember, we motivated the definition of this line integral by using the physical concept of work. And so one of the implications of this is that if I have a conservative vector field, then the work done as it moves an object in a closed loop is zero. And that should make sense. That's the whole idea of conservative. That whatever you do moving it out, you get back out of the system when you return to the original state. So clearly, conservative vector fields are very important. It would be very important for us to know when do we have a conservative vector field? When is a vector field conservative? It will allow us to use the fundamental theorem to evaluate line integrals. It has this very important physical implication. So we can even say that, all right, if you have a line integral, which is independent of path in D, then our vector field F in the integrand is a conservative vector field. So that's an important characterization, but really it's not that useful if we were trying to determine if a vector field is conservative. It would be very difficult, and in most cases impossible, to make an argument that a particular uh, line integral is independent of path because there's infinitely many points in D, and connecting any points in D, there's infinitely many paths and so you can't simply just do a few examples and make a conclusion. That's not enough. You would have to make a rigorous mathematical argument explaining why that line integral is independent of path, no matter how you choose the initial and terminal points, and no matter how you choose the path, you're always going to get the same answer. That's a difficult task. So it's an important characterization but it doesn't really help us test if a uh, vector field is conservative. So let's see if we could develop a more useful test. Suppose I have a vector field with only two component vector functions and it's conservative. Now, since it's conservative, we know that it actually equals the gradient field of some scalar function f So that means that the first component function is the partial derivative of f with respect to x. And the second component function is the partial derivative of f with respect to y. Now, if uh, f has continuous second order partial derivatives, we know by Clairaut's theorem that the mixed partials are equal to each other. Well, how does that help us? Well, the partial of the mixed partial of xy is the same as the partial of p with respect to y. And the partial mixed partial of f with respect to y then x is the same as the partial of q with respect to x. So those guys should be equal to each other. So if we have a conservative vector field, then the partial of P with respect to Y should equal the partial of Q with respect to X. And so let's go ahead and write that out. If we have a conservative vector field and its component functions have continuous first order partial derivatives, that means that this lowercase f has continuous second order partial derivatives, then by Clairaut's theorem, we get that the partial of P with respect to Y uh, 
equals the partial of q with respect to x. Now, what would be nice, so this is a, a property of conservative vector fields. What would be nice is that if we could use that property to say that, oh, if you've got this property, then you must be a conservative vector field. That's what the converse would tell us. That would mean that if we know that these partial derivatives are equal to each other, then we would be able to conclude that f is a conservative vector field. Can we do that? And the answer is, well, partially yes. In some cases, yes. Which cases? Well, we need to learn a couple of things. We need to understand what is a simply connected region. And to understand what a simply connected region is, we need to know what a simple curve is. Well, a simple curve does not intersect itself. So let's look at some examples of curves and their properties. Here we have a simple closed curve. It's closed because its initial point and terminal point uh, are the same, and it's simple because it does not intersect itself. Here we have a simple curve, but it's not closed. Here we have a closed curve, but it intersects itself right here, so it's no longer simple. And then here we have a curve that's not closed, nor is it simple because it intersects itself. So what about a simply connected region? A simply connected region is a connected region D with the following property. Every simple, simply closed curve in D uh, encloses only points in D. So that's the idea. Really, the idea is that D should not have any holes in it. If it has a hole in it, then you could have a simple closed curve all in D, but then the points inside that simple closed curve, some of them would be outside of D. But if I have a simply connected region, then I know that uh, if P and Q have the continuous first order partial derivatives, so Clairaut's theorem is going to apply to that lowercase f, and those partial derivatives, the partial of p with respect to y equals the partial of q with respect to x, are equal to each other throughout d, then you can conclude that f is conservative. So this is a great thing. Now you need to have this simply connected region, uh, but if you do, it is a very simple test to determine if a complicated vector field is conservative. So Let's look at a couple of examples. Here I have the vector field with components y squared minus 2xy and then 2xy. So remember the first component function is p, the second component function is q, going in alphabetical order. And so the partial of p with respect to y would be what 2y minus 2x, whereas the partial of q with respect to x it's just going to be 2y. Those are not equal to each other. f is not a conservative uh, vector field. Let's look at a second vector field. Here our component functions are even more complicated. I have 2xy plus y to the power of negative 2, and then my q function is x squared minus 2x y to the power of negative 3. Now, our domain here is only positive y. So we can't have y equal to 0 uh, because we have the reciprocal of y in each function. And so our domain is going to be the upper half plane, where y is strictly positive. All right, well, let's look at our partial derivatives partial of p with respect to y, I'll get 2x from the first term, and then negative 2y to the negative 3 power in the second term. 
taking the partial of q with respect to x, I'll get 2x from the first term, and then minus 2y to the negative 3 power from the second term. So they're equal to each other. I have a simply connected, connected domain. So I can conclude that f is a conservative function. Now the other way that I could determine if f is conservative is if I could actually find some scalar function f whose gradient equals the, um, the, the vector field. Uh, but this is a much simpler test of all I'm, maybe before I make all that effort, it would be worthwhile to know, hey, is it a conservative vector field? Yes, all right, I should be able to find that lowercase f. All right, so uh, let's go ahead and do that then. So we're going to find a, a scalar function f, but of three variables. We've not done one of these, where the gradient of f equals this vector field here. Well, how do we go about this? Well, if the gradient of lowercase f equals this vector field, that means the first component function has to be the partial of f with respect to x. So let's anti-differentiate this with respect to x, and that'll give me a candidate for f. So anti-differentiating with respect to x, well, y squared z is just a constant, so I get x y squared z. Here I have 2x z squared, that becomes x squared z squared, plus a constant. Well, I don't get a constant. Uh, the constant of integration when I'm anti-differentiating using partial anti-differentiation with respect to x, that would be any function which only has y and z in it. Because if I were to take the partial derivative of something with only y and z, if I take the partial derivative with respect to x, that would be zero. So I can have any function here. It could have constants in it. It could also have any term which only has a y and a z in it. Well, let me do that for the second component function, which must be the partial derivative of f with respect to y. Anti-differentiate with respect to y, I'll get x y squared z plus, well, I could have any function that depends only on x and z, because I would consider that a constant when I take the partial derivative with respect to y. And I could do the same thing with the third component function. I anti-differentiate with respect to z, and that would give me, well, x y squared z plus x squared z, x squared z squared, plus a third function which only depends on k and y which would be considered a constant if I take a partial derivative with respect to z. Now, I have to look at these three and see, could I come up with a function which would have the right terms so that all of my partial derivatives would be correct? And the answer is yes. If I just set my g and k functions to zero. Really, the only two terms I need are the x y squared z and the x squared z squared. Now, I've got those two terms in my first and third component. In the second component, though, I only have x y squared z, but I said I could add in any function that only depends on x and z. And that would be just x squared z squared. When I take the partial with respect to y, the partial derivative of x squared z squared is zero. And so I'll get the correct second component. So my scalar field would be the function xy squared z plus x squared z squared. Its gradient is the original vector field. All right.
So let's go ahead and use that to evaluate the line integral of f dot dr, where the path c has the parameterization r of t equals radical t, comma t plus 1, comma t squared, where t goes from 0 to 1. So I'm not going to evaluate this directly. I'm going to use the fundamental theorem. I would just need to find, now that I know this uh, scalar function whose gradient is the vector field, I only need to evaluate that scalar function at the terminal point and subtract off its value at the initial point. So at the terminal point, when t equals 1, I'll have the uh, point 1, 2, 1, 1, comma, 2, comma, 1. And then at the initial point, when t equals 0, I'm going to get 0, comma, 1, comma, 0. And evaluating my recently found scalar function at those two points, and then taking the difference, that gives me 5 for my answer.